the BYD Atto 3 is quite possibly the most important brand new EV to be launched here for the Malaysian market right now. It is the very first full electric car to be relatively affordable with mass market appeal. If you're looking to buy your very first EV here in Malaysia, this is without a doubt your best option right now. Why do I say that? What's so good about it? And what's the catch? What's not so good? plus the proper real-world driving range right here on Malaysian roads. Let's find out all that and more in this video. While I do believe that the Malaysian market has hit that all-important inflection point for EV adoption and EV acceptance, let's be honest, by and large, this is still very much a rich man's game. You've got fantastic EVs from BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Volvos, and as good as they are, they are priced well beyond the means of an average Joe in Malaysia. Even non-premium brands like Hyundai and Kia, they are selling EVs at 200, even 300,000 ringgit, so they are far from affordable. This, however, changes all that. At just under 150,000 ringgit for the standard range, going up to just under 168,000 for this extended range version over here, the BYD Atto 3 is the very first mass market EV in the Malaysian market. It's not the cheapest EV yet, of course. That title goes to the GWM Aura Good Cat at 140,000. But yeah, that is a much smaller car with a narrower, tighter audience, I think. And in fact, if you were to compare the top spec to top spec, this top version of the BYD is actually 2,000 ringgit cheaper than the top spec Good Cat. So yeah, in terms of value, this is off to a great start. I think it's unbeatable right now in this market. Let's start with a quick introduction to the brand. If you've never heard of BYD, you probably haven't been paying too much attention to the EV game because they are now a major player on the global stage. In fact, as of right now, they are the biggest, highest volume EV car maker in the entire world, having overtaken Tesla in 2022. Now here's an interesting fact. BYD said it took them a long 13 years to sell the first million NEVs. The second million came in just one year and the third million came in six months. That is an astronomical growth rate for a brand new car brand. So yeah, BYD is taking the world by storm and now it's Malaysia's turn. With its local partner Sam Dabi Motors, it has pledged to invest no less than half a billion ringgit to develop and market the brand here in Malaysia. And by the end of 2024, it expects to have no less than 40 outlets all around the country. That is clearly a very ambitious target and having spoken to them, their level of confidence is just impressive. But enough of the big picture, let's talk about the car itself. The Atto 3 is a B-segment SUV, but it's bigger than both the Proton X50 and the Honda HR-V. To me, this is just about the perfect size for a family SUV like this, both on the outside and the inside. On to styling, this is a very simple design. This is hardly the most exciting, modern, futuristic car you can look at, but at least it's not offensive in any way. The details, however, are quite nice. This full wing has a nice satin finish, while the full chrome BYD lettering really stand out at the front. The headlights with the twin LED projectors with blue highlights look properly modern as well. Overall, this looks pretty boring, somewhat generic, I would say, but it's pretty handsome car overall, I think. On the side, this top spec extended range version get these nice 18 inch alloys with a diamond cut finish and plastic aero inserts. I think they look fantastic. What's not so good are the standard tire options because we are getting Atlas Batman A41s here. Silly name aside, they're just not very good tires. They are very loud and they don't give too much grip. If you're buying this car, I would definitely recommend you change the whole set to a proper branded one, preferably EV specific tires. Another disappointment is this. This car does have keyless entry, of course, but there is just a single entry point from the driver's door. On the left side or any other door, yeah, too bad, doesn't work. And worse still, despite this being a modern electric vehicle, the button is actually a physical button that you have to press instead of a touch button or a sensor. That is so old school. What I do like, however, is that the doors cover the entire bottom sill of the car. So if you drive through some mud or more likely in Malaysia, some flood water, when you come back out, you won't be dirtying your clothes on the lower sill. That is a nice touch. 
At the back, I would describe it as a little bit generic again because if you cover up the badge, this could be any car from any brand out there. But then again, that could be a little bit unfair for BYD because they are still a very young brand. Perhaps they haven't zeroed in on a proper design language yet. But having said that, we've also seen far more interesting designs coming from BYD such as the new Seal and Dolphin, both of which are also coming to Malaysia soon, so stay tuned for that. Just like the front, the details are pretty nice. The D-pillar covers have this really cool fish scales look, which sort of fit the whole aquatic theme, you know, Seal, Dolphin and so on. Plus the combination of a full width chrome strip and LED lights look really cool, especially at night. What I don't like is this big empty piece over here. It just looks a little bit plain, like something is missing right down the center. And then there's this long build your dreams lettering spelled out in full. I mean, I get it. That's what your brand stands for. But yeah, it's nowhere near as trendy or as catchy as like, you know, Range Rover. I don't think it's worth spelling it out in full like that. A simpler BYD logo, maybe down the center down here would have looked much better, I think. But anyway, let's move on to the inside, which is far less boring. Inside, this car is just absolutely wild. After the stoic colour inside the lines kind of exterior design, this feels like a whole different car. In fact, if you were to put photos of the car's exterior and interior side by side, no one's gonna guess that it's of the same exact car. Design cohesion aside, however, I don't think that's such a bad thing because this to me is a fantastic interior. It's so different in here, so unique, so organic that you find things inside here that you won't find on any other cars out there. Just look at the dashboard shape, it's so rounded, it's just nothing else I've seen before. Moving further down, you've got all these weird textures and stripes that is somewhat designed to look like human muscle fibers in a, you know, exaggerated anime kind of way. And then further down, you've got these giant icon vents with big controls. And on the side, the door handles are these weird tabs that you pull on the speaker grill. Further down, you've got guitar strings. This is just a wild, wild interior. It's definitely a love it or hate it kind of design. For me, I think it's a little bit too much for myself, but I'm sure a lot of people will absolutely adore the craziness of this interior. What do you think of it? Let me know in the comments below. And then we get to the proper party piece of this interior. Pay close attention to that screen over there. At the press over button, it turns a full 90 degrees to go from horizontal to a vertical position. This is a proper industry first. You won't find this on any other car out there today. I think out of all the interior gimmicks we've seen so far, you know, things like voice recognition, voice controls, you know, gesture controls and so on, this is by far the most effective one yet. This will for sure impress your friends and get them to talk about it. So yeah, job done right there. But it's not a pure marketing gimmick either because there are actual usages for having this in a vertical orientation. For instance, for full screen navigation, a vertical screen just shows your next turns, your next directions in a much better way, much clearer way than in a horizontal screen. Plus, you can also use it as a split screen like in a normal tablet so you can show two things at once. How good is that? If there is one fault, however, it's just that there's a bit of a delay from when it switches from orientation to the next. Look at that. There's a bit of a delay, half a second, one second delay before it switches to the next orientation. I think a little bit faster would have looked much cleaner, far more refined. As for the screen itself, it's very easy to use. It's good on the eyes as well. It looks quite nice, plus big icons here and there. Right now, we don't have access to Apple CarPlay or Android Auto just yet, but that will come as part of an over-the-air update for the car sometime in Q2 2023. One thing I do hope, however, is that when Apple CarPlay does come, we will still have some permanent controls for the air conditioning down the bottom of the screen. My favorite feature of the screen is this. This has a proper onboard dash cam. So just press a button over here. It shows you a full direct live feed of what's in front of you. Just, yeah, look at that. It's proper live right there. And then you press playback and you've got all your previous driving sequences. Just press that to play. And yeah, it looks really, really good. Beyond that, you've also got all the parameters, all your speed, your gear, and whether you're pressing the accelerator or pressing the brakes, everything is embedded within the screen itself. That is such a fantastic feature to have. Everything is also saved into an SD card mounted under the dashboard of this car. 
As for build quality, everything is generally very good. The entire top half of the dashboard, the door cards, the center console, the centerpiece muscles over here, all the way down to here, everything is nice and soft touch, proper premium materials used throughout the car. But there is one pretty glaring fault. The cubby holes on the side, they're just in plain hard plastic. They're not lined in felt or anything. So if you were to put like a smart tag or anything there, yeah it rattles around a little bit that is pretty annoying and then the center boss of the steering over here that's textured plastic just looks a little bit cheap plus this big byd logo i'm pretty sure there is a nicer way to place your logo down the center right now it looks a little bit yeah cheap moving on i do like this big and chunky gear selector over here plus this glass crystal style start stop button i also like the fact that they've got a whole bunch of physical controls down here including the all important volume knob as a whole this car has far better ergonomics than most cars from china that i've seen so far and that includes the seats as well because they are supremely comfortable they are super soft to the touch and they'll just hold you all in the right places as well these are fantastic front seats from any car at any price at the back here, the Atto tree is really good as well. As you can see, there's plenty of leg room and headroom. And even if you're really, really tall, you should be able to fit in the back here just fine. I am 167 centimeters tall for your reference, and that is my own driving position. And I've got plenty of room left in all directions, really. This is also a pretty wide car, so you can easily fit three adults in the back here with no issues at all. Seat comfort, again, fantastic. Just like the front seats, they are remarkably soft, really comfortable, and it hugs you in all the right places as well. And I especially like the seat design over here with a combination of white, blue, black and red. I think they look really good. Other than that, the usual high floor issue with most EVs is pretty minimal in this car. Sitting up straight, my tyres are all properly supported. So all in all, this is a fantastically comfortable interior as a whole. Other than that, you've got the usual things like rear aircon vents, USB charging sockets, both in USB-A and USB-C, plus plenty of pockets to hold your phone, your tablet, and so on. This big panoramic sunroof is one of the biggest I've seen in a car like this, and it really opens up the cabin very nicely. One good thing to note is that this car has not two, but three Isofix anchors, including one for the front passenger seat as well. So you can easily fit three large child seats in this car, no issues at all. If there's one issue I have with this interior, it's this. All the airbag logos have Chinese letterings on it. It just cheapens the whole car down, I think. One last thing, the boot space is a pretty decent size, 440 liters. Plus you get a very wide and deep under floor storage for your charging cables and so on. You can even set the floor to a lower level if you need that extra height. Of course, you can even fold the rear seats down for a completely flat floor. So this overall I think is a pretty complete practical SUV package. One thing though, this tailgate even at the highest position is set pretty low, so if you are taller than me, which most of you are, obviously you run the risk of hitting your head on the tailgate. That's not so good. Anyway, let's go find out how this car drives. So on the move, the Atto 3 is powered by a single electric motor powering the front wheels. Whether you're buying the standard range or this extended range version, you get the exact same output. 204 PS and 310 Newton meters of torque. Now, those figures, you know, may not sound all that exciting, especially since we're all so used to insanely fast EVs like Teslas and so on. But trust me, this car is super quick. Now, let's put it this way. If a Honda HRV, which is about the same size as this, if that HRV had the same amount of performance as this, that car would be proudly wearing the Type R badge. I'm not kidding. So this car's claim to do 0 to 100 in just 7.3 seconds and yeah, yep, it does it very, very well. This is an extremely fast car, as I've said. And even if you don't think 7.3 seconds is all that fast, this car feels way quicker than that. If you are to compare this against a performance hot hatch, you know, the ones with 200, 250 horsepower, this feels quicker than that. I'm not even kidding. 
even compared to its closest competitor, the GWM Aura Good Cat, this has around 60 PS and 100 Newton meters more than that, and on the road, it feels that much quicker still. So as a whole, this car's performance is nothing short of impressive. If you're planning to have this car alongside any petrol car, be warned, your other car is going to feel very slow from now on. The good thing is, this car manages to be this fast without having to feel overpowered in any way. Like in a few EVs out there, they can be a little bit overpowered, a little bit intimidating to drive. You just plant your foot down and the car just shoots forward. It might catch you off guard a little bit. This car, especially in eco or normal modes, it just feels like a normal car. The power delivery is still immediate, but it's nowhere near as explosive as in other EVs, which to me is not such a bad thing. This, after all, is a family SUV. It's not the kind of car that you want to jump off the line all the time. So a little bit of hesitancy, a little bit of suppleness of power delivery goes a long way. I think that makes the car a more comfortable one to be in. Now let's talk about the battery pack because that's pretty much the only difference between the two variants. The standard range version gets a smaller 50 kilowatt hour battery pack while this extended range version gets a slightly bigger 60 kilowatt hour battery pack. As for range, BYD is marketing the cars here using the far more optimistic NEDC test cycle figures. So officially it's 480 km range for this car, but you know what, we all know NEDC can just be thrown out the door, it's not realistic at all. Thankfully the Atto 3 is also sold in most other major markets including Europe and Australia, so we do have official WLTP figures which we can refer to. So for the standard range, that is 345 km and for the extended range it's 420 kilometers on the WLTP test cycle and you know what this car can actually do the claimed figures with no sweat at all this in fact is the very first EV that I've driven here in Malaysia that can go even close to the WLTP range at all most other EVs out there get around 90% of the WLTP range well this gets a full 100% it says 420 on paper you actually get 420 as well well. And that range is even more crucial because this uses BYD's patented LFP blade battery pack. This LFP blade battery is such a big step forward for EVs, so much so that Tesla has now started to buy blade batteries from BYD to put on their cars in certain markets. Unlike other conventional batteries, you can actually charge this battery to 100% to full every time you charge it. Now you see, with a lot of other brands, you are only recommended to charge to 80-85% to on a regular basis. You can of course charge it to 100% every now and then, especially if you're going long distance and so on. But by and large, on a daily basis, you should be charging to 80-85% most. With this LFP battery, you can just charge it to 100% every single time. And that point is very, very important because say a Hyundai Ioniq 5 or a BMW iX, it may have a real world range of around 430 to 450 kilometers. But because you're only allowed to charge to 80-85% on a regular basis, your usable range drops down to 360 or 350. This car, you get 420 every single time you charge. Now speaking of charging, this has a pretty slow onboard AC charger of only 7 kilowatts. But then again, you're likely using this to charge overnight anyway. So whether it takes between 5 to 6 hours or 9 to 10 hours to go for a full charge, it hardly matters because you're leaving it overnight anyway. For DC, that's where the faster charging gets even more important. The standard range version has a maximum DC charging rate of 70 kilowatts, while the extended range like this has a maximum rate of 80 kilowatts. Again, that is significantly quicker than its closest competitor, the GWM Aura Good Cat, that has a maximum rate of around 60, but is nowhere near as fast as most other EVs out there that typically have a maximum 150, 180, 200 and so on. But then again, because this has a smaller battery to begin with, so even at a slower rate, you can still go up to 80% at not too long of a period. You can go from 0 to 80% in just about 45 minutes with this car, which to me is pretty fast enough. 
All right, let's move on to driving dynamics. And this is where BYD takes a little bit of a misstep, I think. Here, the lack of experience from the brand in making cars really show. With most other brands, they usually have a separate R&D center to fine-tune the cars for markets outside of its domestic market. Brands from Japan and Korea usually have a headquarters in, say, Europe or maybe Australia. This car, however, is fully designed and tuned for the Chinese market and roads, which doesn't really fit the rest of the world. As it is right now, the suspension is just a little bit too softly sprung, a little bit sloppy over varied roads. If you're going on a big flat highway like the roads are in China, it's completely fine. But here in Malaysia, our roads are just littered with undulating bumps, we got mid-corner ruts and so on, and this car just struggles to comply with all those things. Half the time, you feel like you are somewhat less in control of this car compared to most other cars. The Proton X70, the original CBU version with the full China spec suspension, felt a little bit like this. And Proton very easily fine-tuned that car to fit local Malaysian roads. Doing the same would significantly improve this car's handling, I think. As it is, the body control is not too bad. The body roll is there, but it's not excessively so. But when you ask it to do more than one or two things in quick succession, that's when you have a problem. When you are braking hard and turning, the rear end just feels like it's about to step out. And yeah, it feels a little bit less safe than in most other cars of this height. Now again, these are extreme cases. Most of the time, if you're driving this car, normally you won't really feel such a big difference. This feels like a big, softly sprung car, and for the most part, it's fine. But if you are planning to drive this car up mountains or even slightly faster through corners and whatnot, this really is not the best car to do so. The tires play a big role here, of course. Again, like I said, you're much better off changing the tires as soon as you buy the car. But as for comfort, it is mostly positive. Around town, this is perfectly comfortable, and on the highways, it's superb. It really filters out most of the rough surfaces of the road, and for the most part, it feels really, really good. Almost premium car level of comfort in this car. But as mentioned, once you hit a really bad patch of roads, then yeah, the lack of finesse of the suspension really shows its ugly hand. By now, I'm sure you'd have noticed the very high level of road noise and wind noise coming in through the cabin, which is a bit of an issue with this car. I'm not sure how much of it is down to the bad tires, but there's really too much road noise coming into the cabin right now. Wind noise is also a bit intrusive, even though I'm just going at about 80 to 90 kilometers per hour right here. At 110, it is properly loud. It can definitely use a bit of an improvement in this segment. Now, of course, most of the time you'll be driving with the radio turned on, playing your Spotify and so on, and the speakers are actually pretty good on this car. So, yeah, unless you are just reviewing the car like I am, most of the time, I think you'll have a pretty decent sound experience with this car. One last thing to note is the Active Driver Assist systems on this car. This does have the full works, level 2 semi-autonomous driving, autonomous emergency braking, adaptive cruise control, and so on. Now, this car's lane centering system is just about okay. It can't really cope with tighter turns, so out on the highways, most of the time it's okay, but it doesn't really handle roads like Kara and so on, so it's not quite up to the best in terms of those systems. But for the most part, including how it works on local traffic jams, it's more than good enough, I think. I like the fact that with all these new EVs that we're getting, we're getting all the features, whether you're buying the base model or the most expensive top spec model. Now, this is a big change that we really needed on the Malaysian car industry. So that's my full review of the BYD Atto 3 here in Malaysia. In short, I think if you're looking to buy an EV at any price range, I think you should do yourself a favor and take a look at this car first because this is such a fantastic electric SUV. Yes, it looks a bit boring, a bit generic on the outside, and its run and handling can be fine-tuned further. But behind all that, this is the complete package. The interior is spacious and practical, and to drive it's everything you want from a car like this. It's very fast, very comfortable, 
and efficient as well. This is the first EV that I've tested here in Malaysia that can easily match its WLTP claimed range. 420 kilometers is achievable not on paper, but in the real world, easy without any sweat. Plus, the fact that this uses an LFP battery means that this effectively has a longer usable range than far more expensive EVs out there, including the Hyundai Ioniq 5, Mercedes EQA, the Volvo C40, BMW iX, and so on. All that for under 170,000 ringgit, this is an absolute stunner from this point on i think all other brands have to really step up their ev game hard and fast or risk being left behind by byd it is that good so what do you think of this review and the byd ato 3 let me know in the comment section below for now thank you for watching and stay safe everyone